Joining me, you know him from Knicks Fan TV, the newest member of the 10,000 Sub Club. It's Mr. CP of Knicks Fan TV, the guy I got to stand next to and endure the instant shock and misery <laughs> when we found out that the Knicks will ha- select third in the 2019 NBA draft. CP, welcome to Nothing But Knicks, sir. I, how can you top that introduction, man? That, that was beautiful, man. Beautiful. How, how you doing, Andrew? Happy Memorial Day weekend. Man. I'm good, man. I uh, This is an honor, a privilege. I, I First of all, con- again, congratulations. 10,000 subs. That's nothing to shy away about. That's that's incredible. Thank you, man. We, we've been uh, diligent at this day by day, just knocking it down and, and putting great content out there. And, uh, you know, we definitely have to thank all, all the fans and all the subscribers for tuning in and for sharing the content. And that's the only way we get to 10,000 is by everybody buying in and believing in it. So it's a huge honor. Now, when did you when did you start? I don't want to turn this into like yeah. a biographical interview, but yeah, like when did Knicks Fan TV, when did you start this project? So the first ever episode of Knicks Fan TV took place at the NBA draft of 2017. That was a Frank Neal Aquina NBA draft. Uh, the inspiration behind Knicks Fan TV was basically, I'm a diehard New Yorker, born and bred Knicks fan, you know, Giants, Yankees, the whole nine. And mm-hmm. I just thought that the the passion that this fan base brings, we are the best fan base, the most knowledgeable, most passionate fan base in the NBA. I'll put us up against anybody, um, you know, any color, race, creed, uh, gender, doesn't matter. There, there's so many knowledgeable and passionate Knicks fans around the world. Um, and that's what basically put the battery in my back to start this page. I used to watch, uh, somehow I came across uh, like the English Premier League, their fan channels like Arsenal Fan TV, Mm -hmm. Full Time Devils for Manchester United, you name it. And I just really admired the way that these guys captured the passion of their fan bases and how involved their fan bases were in the content and with the team. And I just knew that uh, if there was any fan base in American sports that I could emulate this, it, it was Knicks fans. And that's why I really wanted to start the, the page. Now, Knicks fan TV or Nick. Yeah, Knicks fan TV, mm-hmm. the name. It, I mean, it's it's kind of simple, but it's also kind of genius. How long did you like? Was there any type of brainstorming process when you came up with the name or was it symbol, similar to like? Arsenal fan TV where you just saw something simple and you went with it. It was all Arsenal fan TV, man. I don't even watch Premier League soccer, but I watch the content on on YouTube. That's how drawn in I am to the content and was inspired by the content because I just felt like our fan base has that same passion, but it's spread across so many, you know, social networks, barbershop, water cooler, you know, so I wanted to kind of bottle that into one network, one platform where everybody can just come and have their say uh, on, on the comings and goings of the team and what's going on. How many hours do you think you've spent, if you had to guess, Yeah. just not even just like on air, like working yeah. on this channel? Because I'll say this, after every Knicks game, when you like, mm-hmm. you're, you're going through Twitter and you're, just, you're checking everything and you're mm-hmm. seeing if there's any stats you missed, the one constant throughout the last season and a half since I started, since we, we, we connected – was that when I get to the very top of my timeline, it'll be you in the little square at the very top. That's there's something live going on. And it's like, damn, this guy's hustle is incredible. We hustle, man. I would say on a game night, I would say there's at least maybe four hours of preparation, Jeez, either before man. the game, during during the live stream, or after the game in getting, the con- getting ready to, to go live and to package up the content uh, for redistrib- redistribution uh, further that night and into the next morning. So I would say about three, four hours. Jeez. Like, I, like the guys, listeners of our show know how stretched out I am across our, our podcast network, so they know uh, how much time I spend at times, uh, yeah. whether it be this show or the Met show or specifically post-credits, because recording a podcast is one thing. Um, then going and finding all the clips you want to add is another. Um, so I respect and understand the hustle and the work ethic, man, because it's uh, – Yeah. Uh, how long did it take? Because did you go to school for this? Like how, how self-taught 
on all of this are you? Uh, all self-taught, man. I had a blog back in the day called uh, Talk New York Sports, Tony Sports, and we had ah, a WordPress. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we had a WordPress blog, and we were kind of dipping our feet into into that realm, but it didn't really go anywhere. And then, like I said, it, as time progressed, I just started getting into YouTube, learning how to broadcast on YouTube, how to live stream. And we start. I started doing post game recaps on, from a recorded standpoint, and I realized that I, I couldn't keep up and scale based on the Knicks schedule. So then I said, we need to start doing live streams. So I started doing Instagram live streams. I found Jay Ellis from Nick of Time Show on Instagram, DM'd him and said, hey, let's let's collaborate more on these live streams. So we started doing split screen on Instagram, and then ultimately we moved to YouTube where my goal was to kind of incorporate the fan input through the phone, kind of like, uh, you know, um, Mike and the Mad Dog was a huge inspiration. Ah, okay. I was, I was growing up on Mike and the Mad Dog, Francesca's show, 660 ESPN Radio, so I wanted to kind of incorporate that as well, and that's where the live streams kind of evolved to. Wait, 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 wait. Are you telling me you're a Mongo? I'm, I'm an OG Mongo, oh, man. Mike and the Mad Dog fan <laughs> from the early, early 90s, man. I wouldn't miss a show. And it, like I said, that you know, when you talk about capturing the passion of a fan base, no one did it like them. So do you back, still, back, back. I, I don't mean to completely go off topic here, yeah. but as somebody who's also an old school Mongo that used to come home from school and do his homework watching Francesa and every day. Uh, Chris, Mike and Chris on Yes Network every day. Every um, day. What do you think of the 2019 version of Francesa? Because it's at times crotchety old man, and then at yeah. times it's a it's like Stephen A. Smith, where oh he's playing a character. Yes, you know. Yeah, it's it's you know I I still listen to it out of loyalty and just habit, but he he's starting to get you know a bit on the crotchety side. You know, real just curmudgeon and and antagonistic, you know. But that I mean, that's also what makes it kind of fun, right? Is, yeah. is to hear the callers kind of go back at them, and even the prank callers, and and so on. So uh, I'm still loyal, man. I'm still yeah. loyal to prank to Mike. Yeah, it's different because I would probably be that crotchety if I had to spend three to four hours a day talking to just people on the phone and hearing the same trade and the same jokes and the same opinions over and over again five days a week. There is a hint of arrogance, though, that is what makes him him. Um, I don't know. I also, like, as somebody at Gotham that runs a podcast network, he's kind of my competition. I would never say that, like, we're competing with Mike Francesa. But you know he's technically on an audio medium, so and yeah, the digital and, world. and look how he's look how he's trying to you know extend the brand now with the with the the app, yeah, and with the Twitter presence now. So you can see he's starting to see where the trends are going in terms of pushing that content out there in smaller bite sized clips, being more. Uh, personable, presentable on Twitter to engage with the fan, if you want to call it engagement. So, you know, he, he's trying to survive himself, so you can kind of see each other as competitors, for sure. Now, I'll turn this back on you. Do you then, as a post-game live show, do you then look at, like, the Knicks post-game show, or the Turner guys, or just literally yeah. any other post-game recap show, even, like, on YouTube? Uh, do you then look at those guys as your competition, or is it more as like a community and the way that content is in 2019? Since it's as you go, you can also kind of interact and give props where props is due to somebody that's also doing something right after yeah. a game. Yeah, I, I think there's room for everybody. I think there's something out there for everybody, uh, whether it's you know instant Twitter reactions or uh, someone doing just selfie Periscope feeds. You know, our show is incorporating phone calls and things of that nature. So I, I think there's a lane for everyone to to be successful. I don't really look at other uh, outlets as competition. I just look to grow my own platform because I feel like, you know, we offer something that others can and, and others may offer something that I can. So I just kind of focus on what our strengths are and, and go from there. You know, we started with the live streams. Uh, now the content, we have podcast content, we, we do news, 
We do round tables. Uh, if you've seen the round tables that we've done with uh, Nick's Film School, Macri and, and JB, yep. we got to get you. We got to get you and Jeremy on there as well. When, uh, when say we the word, man. <laughs> yeah, you know, we've, we've had the guys from Posting and Toasting. So I look at it as um, if we if we never did those collaborations, then we wouldn't have that network that we're brewing right now. With, with all of us and and look at what we did you mentioned the the lottery party that we did i mean that was covered on espn on a nationwide scale we packed that place out to the brim that was with, nuts with all followers of, of our brands and that was a beautiful thing man that, that was, that, was that, really... that night was unbelievably nuts just unbelievable and just like i was i was saying the 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 show jeremy and i did the the day after the lottery like the fact that we started planning that thing maybe 10 days before it happened and mm -hmm. what it turned into is just mind blowing. I get it. Like the, the different followings of all of us, it might have actually created an urgency for everybody to go that night. But yeah. man, I, I did not. I got there at 630 thinking, oh, great. I'm an hour early. And I didn't move like you had found you had kind of set up camp. Move. Yeah. You know, and it was like, all right, I guess I'm next to CP the rest of the night. This is awesome, I, but wow, I cannot move. I got there early, man, and I saw how things were kind of setting up. You know, you, you saw the guys that were kind of like jockeying next to the ESPN area. So I was like, you know what? Let me find a place at the end of the bar, set up my show, make sure I get something to eat and a beer at the very least. And yeah, that was it, man. It was a real cool night. Now, YouTube. Um, I don't have to deal with it as much because we don't have a YouTube channel yet. Um, is it as big a cesspool as some people, especially the comment section? Like, it gets a, bra a bad rap. Like, yeah. uh, certain political leaders sometimes that just kind of say whatever they want with no filter get labeled, oh, it's a walking YouTube sec YouTube comment section, you know? How have you had to deal with that? Like, how much do you deal with the the... Uh, vulgar and the garbage that comes from a YouTube comment section. You know what? Not too much, man. I feel like most of our subscribers and, and our followers, they keep it respectful, whether it's in the YouTube chat, so we're doing the live stream, or in the comments afterwards. I think the debates are, are highly respectable. You know, you have guys that will come on and say, you know, you guys don't know anything about basketball, or people that will come on and curse, but I think for the most part, 90% of the interactions we get are thoughtful. Everybody comes with their own opinions. You know, we don't turn anybody down for, you know, what could be a bad opinion or a bad take. Every, every take is welcome, and, and it creates great debate. All right, let's get into this team. Because, yep. like, I don't want to turn this too much into a generic Knicks conversation, but... Mm -hmm. It's the question of the day, every day, for the next, probably the next month. Um, Anthony Davis. Uh, first of all, what do you want to do with the three pick? Who, they, who should they take? And do you think they keep the pick? I think the night of the lottery, my consistent answer across the board is I think they're trading the pick regardless. Um, so I'll ask you, what do you think yeah. happens with the number three pick? I think you got to go R.J. Barrett, whether you're going to keep it or not. You have to go R.J. Barrett. I've been high on him, you know, before the lottery even came. I've, I've said on my shows uh, numerous times that, if you know, if we didn't land Zion, I would certainly be happy with R.J. Barrett. I feel like he's a dog. He's an alpha dog. He has that mentality. He's played at the pro level uh, at different uh, levels, whether it's for Team Canada, uh, Olympic team, Duke. You know, he's played at the highest level, and, and he's excelled at that level. Certainly, he has his weaknesses. Yes, he's lefty dominant. Yes, his jumper needs a bit of work. Yes, his, his free throws need a bit of work. But I think those are things that can be worked on. So I think based on the season that we had, the position that we're drafting in, we need star power. And if you're going to go Zion and John ja Morant off the board, the next best thing is, is to me is R.J. Barrett. That's where I'm going at three. I don't hate it. Like, I... It's interesting to see how everybody's become an R.J. Barrett expert all of a sudden. I, mm -hmm. I've i done, like, my share of YouTube deep dives. His offensive game is obviously there. I The defense just isn't there for me yet. I It's also still tough because he's at a, in a system that doesn't really teach defense. He's uh, in college, so you're rot not really, really being pushed defensively, which actually mm -hmm. scares me more than anything else. Um, 
I, I I stay with my take. I don't think he's going to play a minute for the Knicks, though. I think the Anthony Davis uh, is going to – like, I, I'm not saying this isn't what I want. It's just more what I think will happen, you know? If Durant and Kyrie and all these big guys are coming, the window that they're going to have to win isn't going to allow a guy like Barrett to develop into whatever he's going to eventually become. They're going to want to try and win now, you know? I agree with you 100%, and I've been saying this on our shows and, and kind of playing devil's advocate with the fans – in that, you know, a lot of the fan base doesn't want this Anthony Davis trade. Which I based don't understand. On, I really don't understand. Yeah, ba- based on my test of the waters on, on whatever account I'm managing, a lot of the fans are not with the AD trade. They see the mellow trade all over again oh, God. in terms of gutting the team, in terms of gutting your youngsters. Yes, you'll still have your own draft picks to deal with, but they just see it as, you know, sending five guys and five potential picks two for one guy who is, could be the third wheel on this team with, with the Kevin Durant and the Kyrie Irving. Oh, not at all. I, I, I have to – I am not disrespecting your, the, your the fans of Knicks fan TV, the fans yeah. of our show, the, the Knicks fans that love the young guys. I, not, I do not mean any disrespect when I say mm-hmm. this. If this – all was happening a year ago when Anthony Davis was playing as better, as good as anybody and much better than like Kawhi is right now or like Dame Lillard who had this incredible first two rounds. He got swept out of the playoffs by Anthony Davis because he was an impenetrable force. I don't understand the, the, the prospect hugging for a team that won 17 games for a chance to get for my money, the fourth best player in the league. It's Durant. It's Giannis. It's Who, LeBron. Put uh, LeBron in there. Uh, where you, where you put LeBron here's at? my here's my sports radio take. LeBron's like out of my top eight. The guy just does, like I'm listening. Like no disrespect to like LeBron's legacy and what he yeah. is all time, but 37 yeah. year old LeBron next year cannot be better than all of these guys that are currently in their prime, especially on the yeah. defensive end. You know, I've been telling people LeBron might fall off harder than Melo did, man. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know, man. If he's going to be able to adjust his game, man, to Le- be an effective player going forward, LeBron at least has the efficiency to where I actually think he'll adjust in a v- much more intelligent way than Melo did. Melo just flatly did not want to start doing things that the modern NBA does. His, yeah, his in love with the mid range game, as the mid range game is not even just dying, but like being frowned upon like anytime he would yeah. take a fake a three and take two steps inside the three-point line he would get chastised by his teammates you know yep. like that's a terrible shot what are you doing absolutely especially in houston um i like i talked about to alex about this a couple weeks ago i cannot put this as the mellow trade because carmelo anthony at his peak was nowhere near as good as anthony davis was for the last 35 games last year and healthy Anthony Davis for me, like you become the finals favorite. If he's the third best player on your team or just part of a big three on your team next year. Here's another reason I don't necessarily see it as the mellow trade is because when we did make the mellow trade, it was basically mellow and nothing. I mean, I think the fan base overall overrated, highly overrated Amari Stoudemire's contributions to this team. Yeah. I, I saw that after his first year, he was pretty much useless. And so you had that that rock sitting in a max contract with no ability to get much help. And then they go out and get Tyson Chandler, which didn't really – I mean, yeah, the Knicks tape year was, was a great year. It was an aberration, <laughs> but had no longevity. And so I think that's the reason why I don't necessarily see the AD trade – being aligned with the mellow trade because you would still have potentially Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving um, to, to make that big three. My thing is this, though. It's like all season long from the last offseason to now, the front office has been preaching no quick fixes, um, you know, no shortcuts, not going to do any, make any brass decisions. And they've been getting out in front of the PR train and trying to emphasizes every step of the way, any type of event that they have. I think the fan base has gotten around that in terms of developing our young prospects. So I don't know how they turn around and just gut the whole team because that's what you have to do. You're going to have to gut the whole team here. You can, but 
like like we just said with Melo and, and Amari, that was plan B. Like the plan A for that entire the, the what Donnie Walsh set up in two thousand eight when he first traded Zach Randolph and Eddie Curry and Jamal Crawford was we want to have as much cap space as possible so we can uh-huh. get LeBron basically build the big three in New York in twenty ten. That all failed. He only left with Amari. And the quick fix, like you just said, was let's get Carmelo. And then right. plan B was that. Yeah. Adding Anthony Davis and gutting the team for him would not be plan B. It would be finishing plan A, which should be building a championship contender, not developing prospects, which like yeah. you can do that, do both, like develop a team into a contender. But you also have to get a little lucky. Like the Warriors yeah. get tossed around as this this juggernaut that was built through the draft yeah it, i don't think they intended for the number seven pick in the draft to be the greatest shooter of all time yeah, they got that's lucky true. That's true. so yes, could have been our luck right uh, i <laughs> listen, very easily been our luck they also could have just taken DeRozan, and then we wouldn't yeah. be as upset about it but yes sure. like they were one pick away from steph curry i i, I get annoyed when i hear the the uh almost with the draft because then it yeah. advocates for tanking at times and i just like draft the best player available that's it, what you it's can all do. it's all a crap shoot man and i agree with you i think yes some of it is development some of it is getting the right free agents at the right time and some of it is outright luck you know maybe yeah. luck is is the overlay over over both paths so it's just very interesting man because it's like you said the window for bringing in kevin durant Along with the young players, they, the windows just do not align, right? Yeah. You're asking for you're asking for a huge leap from Kevin Knox. You're asking for a huge leap from Mitchell Robinson. You're asking for a great rookie year from R.J. Barrett, just to even get to the second round of the playoffs. Yeah, and I just don't, I don't think these type of opportunities come along as often yeah. as as we imagine. You don't get the chance to put together a big three like this, like. Look at what the Celtics did in 08. They tanked that year for Kevin Durant. And then when they fell to the five pick, they traded it for Ray Allen and then traded right. for KG. Traded for KG. And the next four years, they were contenders in the fi- for the finals. Like, yeah. you have to maximize. Like, that's what I think Mer- Perry and Mills have done really well is they've turned their team into a collection of assets that people might want. Yeah, which quickly. That's the, really that's quick. the, the, the victory he should claim from all of this is that this isn't like people didn't really want Tim Hardaway Jr. or Courtney Lee or Joe Kim Noah or Trey Burke and with one trade which I still we can talk about the KP trade in a minute I still don't yeah. like believe that that happened this year and how quickly we all moved on from that um, right. they now are in the very best position and this is coming off a 17 win season but mm-hmm. again a reminder these assets that we're all in love with won 17 games this year. This is a long way away from this becoming a playoff contender, let alone a championship team. Um, I just, I, again, I think if this was a year ago and we had the chance to get Anthony Davis, you'd do it immediately and there would be no pushback. Uh, yeah. My other question, though, mm-hmm. as somebody who is way more, like, first-hand basis with the the Knicks, the, the tone of Knicks fans, mm-hmm. They don't want to trade Mitch for Anthony Davis, right? Absolutely not. Do you Mitch's not want to? I do not want to part with Mitchell Robinson. Ugh, okay. That was the re- you said. You said you were surprised at how quickly we moved on from KP this year, and part of the reason was watching this kid that was picked thirty six in the draft come out of nowhere, finish second in the league in blocks, tie all these block shot records, all these Knicks rookie records. I mean, I think Mitch. Has he's become a fan favorite, man? It's hard to part with Mitch, and I don't know. Like I said, I, the, the fan base is—they're not on deck for this Anthony Davis straight, by and large. I think, the, man, I love Mitch too. That's why, like, I get it. You know, like as a yeah. as a, just a Knicks fan, I get it. I just also look at what New Orleans is going to want, and Mitch Robinson is going to be on that list. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> hey, they're going to want to bring Mitch home. David Griffin just got that job. You know, he wants to keep that job of being good graces. Someone's going to get fleeced here between us and the Lakers. Uh, someone's going someone's gonna to get fleeced here. And I, I, that's, my, that's my take. What, what do you think about the Lakers? Well, and, I don't – I, I actually do buy the – I know that she refuted them or laughed at the comments. I don't think there's a trade to be had with the Lakers. I just – I mm. don't see how – 
I also just don't see how the Knicks can't beat the offer. You know, like the future yeah. assets of the two Dallas picks, whatever the Knicks, because I think what would actually happen is the Knicks would give their 2020, their own 2021 first round pick unprotected and that unprotected Dallas pick. Like those would be the two picks that they give mm. up. Um, and then it'd probably be a package like the number three pick this year, Kevin Knox, Mr. Robinson, and those two picks probably get it done. Oof. Like, I get it. That's a lot. But you're getting a 26 year old about yeah. to enter the prime of his career. That might yeah. be the best power forward, the most athletic power forward I've ever seen. And the blueprint I keep going back to is the KG trade to the mm-hmm. Celtics. Mm mm-hmm. Because that was seven for one. That was three players and four picks for one yeah, person. That's true. And they and, won and the beloved finals. Beloved Al Jefferson <laughs> and Boston, man. They loved Al Jefferson. They loved Al Jefferson. And, yeah. like, they got over it quick, though. Like, they started, what, 30 and three? And it was, oh, that's why we did that trade. And yeah. I could see that happening well, here, you know? Well, you see, we also have to take into consideration that that team was also fortified with excellent defenders, yeah. veteran leadership. And three-point shooters. You know, they had Tony Allen. They had James Posey. P.J. Brown was doing his thing. Uh, didn't they have Jason Terry on that team as well? Uh, no, Jason Terry came after Dallas. Oh, yeah, he, after he the Dallas era. They had Eddie House. Eddie House. Yeah. Going. So they had nice specialty role players, and that's what we would have to do to make it work. Like, you think about Miami. Like, who's who would be our Shane Battier, our mm-hmm. Mike Miller, you know, those type of guys that would come in know their role specifically, and, and really help this team move the needle well, against the Milwaukee. Well, that's where I actually get more confident about putting that big three together. And I've like to, I've said this a lot, so I apologize if I'm repeating myself. Um, when the Miami Heat acquired the big three, mm-hmm. there were five people on the active roster yes. when the dust settled. It was them three, Udonis Haslam and Mario Chalmers, who they just drafted. Right. And then as they went along... They added Mike Miller and Shane Battier, and uh, eventually they got um, Norris Cole. That the backup, the backup yeah, point yeah. guard. You know, then Chris mm-hmm. Anderson became available. Mm-hmm. When you put a big, talented starting three or five together, you kind of go as you uh, as you go along. That's as that's how you build your contender, your full team. And I think we forget sometimes that you don't have to build your postseason roster in the summer you know like the guys yeah. you were talking about nobody thought rondo was going to become what he became they mm-hmm. developed him into that nobody thought kendrick perkins was going to be the center that team needed i think there are going to be veterans out there that look at the knicks and a, a chance to play a couple years in new york and mm-hmm. and just go compete for a championship as an opportunity and they'll take less like, money like to do Morris it you know twin, one of the mars twins um, one of the mars twins jj yeah. reddick like all reddick, these different yeah. guys i think that will take either the room or the mid-level just to try and win a championship and listen man if if we can do that i'll take it i'm just i'm nervous man i'm nervous which is but, normal because you're a knicks fan like yeah. the ptsd yeah, I, I, that I, it's, it's failed normal. before has happened you know I, i'm just nervous man so but how about this so based on you know our caller reactions. There's two thoughts here to the AD trade that guys have countered with. Number one is some of the fan base look at an AD coming in. You have three superstars with Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant. Somebody has to play that Chris Bosh, Kevin Love role, sacrificing their game a little bit uh, to make things work. And that's why I think that's part of the reason why some guys are leery because they feel mm. like, would you really be able to get a full max Anthony Davis in that scenario? So, or, or who who is going to have to alter their game if, if it's KD, is it AD, is it Kyrie Irving to kind of make that three work? Yeah. So, what I actually go back to is that. I don't think it's going to be Kyrie. I think it's going to be Kemba. And then Kemba will be perfectly happy Mm. averaging 12 assists tonight. Because you look at how laissez-faire and laid back he can be at times in in his career. Like, yes, in Charlotte, his usage rate has had to be through the roof, especially last year. Mm -hmm. Um, If he comes to the Knicks, he's perfectly fine distributing and running the offense. Um so I would think whoever the point guard is is the one that plays off or I guess has to take a step back. Um, I also think if you stagger the minutes, 
Kevin Durant can get his. Anthony Davis can get his. Whoever, Kyrie or Kemba is, uh, whoever's here at point guard can get his. And, like, you worry about all that later. Like, I know in Miami that first year we talk about how much, they of, a, struggled. How much of a failure it was because yeah. they hadn't figured out who's going to have to take a step back. Like, they went to the finals and were two wins away from a championship. Like, right. I don't know how much of a failure it actually right. was, you know? But, well, it seemed like they kind of figured it out in, in the following years. You know, it seems like D. Wade and, and Bosch kind of took that back seat right. and let things flow through LeBron. And then I also think, to your point, staggering the minutes, they did figure out ways to get, you know, Chris Bosch to be the feature in certain sets, you know, and while LeBron and Wade are on the bench and, and vice versa to kind of make sure that – you know, the, the star plays were actually being maximized at some point. Well, see, here's where I actually disagree that, that it took later for them to figure it out. Mm-hmm. That first year, um, they won 58 games. They, in the second round, beat uh, Boston in five. In the next round against the 60-win Bulls team that destroyed him in game one, they then won four straight. And then in the finals, like, I think what eventually had to happen and what Wade recognized had to happen is LeBron just kind of took a step back because Miami yeah. was like the way Dallas was playing them was, you know what, we're just going to make LeBron pass the ball mm-hmm. and not let LeBron beat us. And he'll mentally check out because he's making the smart play. But as a result, he's just standing in the corner, not right. doing anything. And that's what Ray recognized. We can't have that type of talent as a, uh, a third guy standing in the corner. Um, which, I mean, yeah, could happen on whatever super team the Knicks build next year. I still would like to take my chances. <laughs> <laughs> you still roll the <laughs> like, dice. I still would like, you know still what? Dice, and that's what I keep going back to. I love Mitchell Robinson. All these hype videos and what he could become, I, I'm interested to see if everything goes wrong. And I, that's why I completely understand the immediate spin zoning that this fan base is doing. You know, that... Yeah. If we strike out in free agency, we'll be fine. And I'm just like, actually, I'll be pretty disappointed. Like, uh, <laughs> I'm actually be pretty mad if they get nothing this summer after they traded KP and the agony that then rushed to, well, you know what? Summer 2019. And then it's actually, you know what? Maybe in the summer of 2021. And, you know, we're but just kind of what? rolling it over. I just see, I'm, I just, I don't want to put the success or failure of the KP trade on what happens this summer because. Well, I mean, let's say somewhere down the line in the future, these two Dallas picks mm. and the cap space materially, you know, the flexibility that we garnered from this trade. What if it, what if it, you know, rears its head later in 2020, 2021? Yeah. We, we just don't know what, what could happen. So I just, I don't want to put it on, well, we didn't get KD, we didn't get Kyrie Irving. You know, the whole thing was a failure to begin with. I, I, I don't know. I don't want to see that so, so short sighted. Can I give you a hot take? Sure. I think they've already won it. <laughs> I absolutely think they've already won the KP trade. Especially like the PR nightmare. Not even to get into oh, yeah. the legal stuff that's going on with him right now. But like seeing the Lakers, the Pelicans, and the Grizzlies all jump into the top four this year changes the way you look at the lottery. I don't think yeah. the lottery is going to get rid of tanking. It's just going to make it that nobody trades their top 14 pick anymore right. because that could... Absolutely turn into a top three pick. It's very important, man. Absolutely. I agree. Somebody else mentioned that on the show as well. It's a good point, man. Yeah. This new lottery really changed the game in that regard. I just thought it was fascinating that KP was the unicorn. He was who we're going to pair with Durant. He's the next coming. And then in one day, it became, you know what? He was never that good. He's injury prone. (laughs) You know, who's ever been to Latvia? Like He's He's a a snake. snake. Screw that guy. (laughs) Um, oh my god, man! That day was was crazy. Yeah, I. How crazy. did you experience? I've not, I've never talked to you about this. How, what was the day like for you? Because everybody's got a KP trade day story. Um, it was crazy because the way things unfolded, it was like a piece of paper catching on fire that like grew and grew and grew, and you couldn't put it out because the first story that came out on Twitter was KP KP plans to meet with the Knicks because he was not happy or something like that. They say, all right, you know, whatever, you know, they want to hash it out. Okay. And then the next story from Ramona Shelbourne was like, KP leaves the next meeting intimating that he wants to be traded. And you're like, oh, wait, <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, wait, yeah. hold on one second here. Slow down. Let me catch my breath. And then the next refresh was like, KP has just been traded to the Dallas Mavericks. 
And then it was just all pandemonium from there. Uh, we had a thousand people, live concurrent viewers, watching the live stream that yeah. night. We literally were on for like two hours of people just reacting. Phone calls coming in, chats coming in, tweets coming in. We li- we literally had to stop the show with like 20 people still on the switchboard because we were just so, t- so tired <laughs> of talking. Well, how long but- did you go that night? We went it for almost two and a half hours. Jeez. I would say two hours and probably 15 minutes of just straight taking phone calls and, and reactions. To the, it was crazy. Yeah. It was crazy. Because remember when, when Bondi dropped that story maybe a month or two prior that it was like, well, you know, there's a possibility KP doesn't come back. And we slayed him. Like, because, this is the most yeah. ridiculous thing we've ever heard. Yeah, reputation will do that to you. But yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, so a lot of us thought it was so far fetched for it to happen. And then the way it happened so fast, it was crazy, man. Crazy. Yeah. That's the common uh among all the Knicks content creators. It's been like the all of a sudden rush to oh, this is just the normal Thursday. I had Jeremy and I had Mike Vorkanov scheduled for that eve that, that afternoon to come on mm. the pod. And then all of a sudden all this is happening and I'm at work thinking, All right, I uh, this is obviously just something to talk about. And then I see like KP's asked for a trade and it's from Woj. And it's like, wait a minute. There's, there's no way it would happen. And so I then yeah. go to my car and I, I'm like just updating Twitter real quick. And I start driving home <laughs> and I see the Woj, uh, Christoph Porzingis has been traded to the Dallas Mavericks. And it's, it was one of those like, all right, let me now go to at Woj ESPN to see if this is real. That's a blue check mark. Oh yeah. my God. And it was like for the one ride home, I just put my phone away and decided, okay, let me get home and refresh again to see if this is real. And it was legit. It was legit. That's why I like, it, like everybody has said like, that was our craziest episode. I, I remember yeah. talking to Jeremy and it was like literally minutes after I had seen that tweet and I had just gotten home and hopped on Skype. And like, if you listen to that episode, it's clear. I had just turned on my recorder. I was like, all right, let's just talk about this. Cause I have no clue what just happened. It and, was an, an insane. Man. Yeah. Um, insane. And I was at the game the night before. Oh, the Dallas uh, and game. We were, we, I was at the Dallas game the night before watching DSJ and Wesley Matthews at DeAndre kill us. And uh, I remember leaving, going home that night, and a friend of mine worked the uh, the American Express Lounge. And, and we were trying to basically, you know, get down get down in those areas to, to uh, hang out in the lounge. So afterwards, he sends us a text, and it's him arm in arm with Mark Cuban at a bar because he wanted us to come to the bar after the game. We were like, no, nah, we're going to go home. So he sends us a, 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 a text with, with him and Mark Cuban taking pictures in the bar. Mark Cuban with an ear-to-ear grin on his face. It looked like he was half in the bag already, but I'm sure he probably knew something was going on. Man, it's... Uh, and to think it happened like at where we are now, it's May twenty seventh. It happened like four months ago. It feels like it's been six years since the KPJ. Yeah, that's how it feels. <laughs> that's how it feels. But that's the beauty of being a Knicks fan, man. Like no other fan base goes through this much turbulence <laughs> in a yeah. given season. You know, it, it's beautiful, man. Turning it a seventeen win season into an eventful season yeah. is is peak Knicks. You know, it's peak Knicks. Yeah. So, all right. So I've kept you for a while and I really appreciate you giving me the time. Guys, check out Knicks Fan TV. Go on YouTube. After every episode, you will, every every, every, excuse me, after every game, you will see CP in a little window in the top corner of your Twitter screen or I guess follow him on, on Twitter at Knicks Fan TV. And then after every game, if you just log on to YouTube, it'll be the first thing that pops up. It's, it's very good content. It's not the, uh, not to, uh, to belittle the the studio shows, but yeah. like this is rich in like Nick's fandom, and it it's gonna capture more accurately how you're feeling after a game than other places right. will. Yeah, I mean you, you summed it up perfectly. It, it's for the fans, you know. It's not just us pushing our our you know reactions out there and, and wanting to be heard. We want the fans to be heard, whether it's the chats, whether it's your tweets, whether it's your phone calls. We want everybody to be heard and, and to emote their feelings on the team. And that's basically the essence of the channel. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I did mention this to you, though. I do not leave 
uh, let a guest leave without giving him or her a speed round. So okay. are you ready for your first ever nothing but Nick speed well, round? Let's get it on, man. Let's get it. Okay. So we'll start. It, it's going to be both Nick's related, NBA okay. related, and just random related. It's just to get okay. you thinking. All right. You ready? All right. Here we go. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Yes. Wow. Okay. Yes. A speed round. Speed round. That's yep. you're the first person to say yes. But okay. okay. Speed round. Okay. Uh, your favorite Nick ever. Favorite Nick ever, Patrick Ewing. Pick one Netflix show. One Netflix show, Narcos. Oh, good pick. Uh, your most heartbreaking Knicks moment. Most heartbreaking Knicks moment. Recently, the Pacers series against Knicks tape. Mello uh, getting blocked at the summit by Roy Hibbert. I would also say the 95-96 NBA playoffs. Patrick mm. Ewing missing the finger roll. Should have dunked it. I can go on and on, but I'll just give you those two against the Indiana Pacers. Uh, your favorite Knicks celebrity, like your favorite Knicks celebrity. That's the, your favorite celebrity. That's a Knicks fan. That, that's a Knicks fan. I gotta go, Spike. Oh, gee. Okay. I mean, I, I had a, a chance to meet Spike at the Jimmy Fallon show as well. So that that was a cool interaction, cool moment. If you had to, if you could change one result in Knicks history, just one game result, or if you want to say like the Knicks actually picked seventh in yeah. two thousand nine, I think it was when Curry <laughs> got drafted. Change yeah. one result in Knicks history. What would it be? I would have changed. I would have uh, subbed out John Starks for Hubert Davis game mm. seven in Houston. Um, we needed that championship, man. It was ours to for the taking, and you know, losing two in a row that was a heartbreaker, man. Yeah, if I could pause, and, if I could pause, be around for a second. JB yeah. picked the same one. Um, yeah. My actual change would be just that he makes that shot in game six, because then like well, there yeah. you win. <laughs> you know? That's true. That that's true. Either way, we're champions, right? Or or hope we champions. Yeah. We take yeah. Him out seven. Who's the GOAT? Michael Jordan. Who's the most hated Knicks rival team? Miami Heat. Who's your most hated Knicks rival player? Tim Hardaway. Tim Hardaway. Oh, you almost said it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say. I was going to say. I've always said, man, having his pops lurking around Madison Square Garden, I always had like. It's uncomfortable. It's weird. I'm rooting for Tim Hardaway. What am I doing? I couldn't fully embrace Timmy, man. I couldn't fully embrace him. Uh, last movie you, thought you saw in theaters? Endgame. And you loved it? I liked it. I, I definitely liked it. Yeah. Oh, okay. It seems like there's something deeper there, but no worries. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the last one. The Knicks starting five in 2019 will be. On opening night 2019 will be. Kemba. Okay. R.J. Barrett. Kevin Knox. Kevin Durant. Money Mitch. It's like a 55-win team. Hey. Okay, I'll take it. I just... I, I don't know. I'm not sure if this 80 trade... Goes down. I think I, my prediction is that he goes to L.A. and I think they sign Kyrie behind that. Ah, well, can they afford that? Because they already have LeBron. I guess if you do same same thing with the Knicks. If you do it yeah. after that certain deadline, I think, I think so. Okay, so mm, I guess we'll see. Well, we'll see, man. It's gonna be interesting. But listen, it's it's the biggest off season in Knicks history. And uh, I'm I'm ecstatic about it. I'm excited, bro. It might just be like the biggest off season ever. Like I know 2010 and 2016 are up there, but the amount of like the, the NBA is going to look completely different next season. Completely different. The 4Ks have the potential to rock the NBA land. How about Kawhi Leonard? We haven't even talked about Kawhi Leonard. Oh wow, man. that's right. And the greatness of Kawhi Leonard in this NBA playoffs. He's been great to watch, especially with an absence of LeBron James. I mean, watching uh, Kawhi Leonard in these Eastern Conference Finals has been amazing. Yeah, he would be my third overall, by the way. Like, it would go Durant, Giannis, Kawhi, and then Anthony Davis with Steph, like, right there for number four. Like, right I, behind him. So After seeing what I've been seeing... I think I gotta put Kawhi at one just for being a two way player, oh, man. Like I don't I don't think there's a wrong answer in the top three. That's I gotta or put even the top Greek, four, you know. I don't think Greek Freak's ready yet. I, I gotta put Kawhi over Greek Freak. That's fair. Like he did just eliminate him in a playoff he, series. So I like I'm not gonna disagree with you on that. He's been incredible this postseason. Um yeah, man. but like, Good. okay, if this was a year ago, we would be saying, like, I don't want Kawhi. Like, what has he ever done? Like, he just sat out a whole year in San Antonio and the recency Still. bias of it. You know, like, we wouldn't want to trade for the guy. Now, a year later, we're saying the exact same thing about AD. And then Kawhi's, like, 
boosted his resume up to, well, maybe we want Kawhi over Durant. Tremendously, you know? man. I would love to have both. I'd love to have both. But, uh, you know, let's see how, how deep they take Golden State in this series and how much – uh, loyalty he has to the Raptors because if he can throw a wrench into those Clippers plans, then maybe that uh, that that sways KD this way because yeah. according to Mark Stein, the Clippers are a strong consideration. Yeah, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, I, yeah. I I don't see the legacy play being oh, I'm going to leave the greatest team ever to go to the Clippers. You know, right? Stay out west, right? Yeah. So. Well, at the same time, you know, you can't count out Jerry West, though, man. The, which the is the only argument hurt. I've seen that, like, my, my, our buddy Fitz that uh, does covers the Rangers, he hopped on this show last week, and he said, like, the the nail in the coffin or the deciding factor with him going to Golden State was Jerry West talking to him and saying, yeah. like, I went 1-8 and eight in the finals, and that's all I'm known for. Like, I don't, right. I got sick of it. And, right. like, my legacy is, is a player that's so much better than a lot of these guys that have four or five titles is just that I won one championship in my nine tries. I don't want that for you. And that's what made him go. I can't then, off of that... Hear him be like, hey, so remember all that stuff I told you about building a legacy? <laughs> Forget all that. Come build Forget your own team that. in the Clippers in the Lakers' shadow, who, you know? Who knows, man? What if what if Bomber's promising a return to Seattle in like two, three years, man? Oh, that I didn't even consider, which is yeah. which would be hilarious. You know? <laughs> That's the plan. like, hey, listen, man. You can be the king of Microsoft, man. We're going back home. We're if going back the- home, man. <laughs> If that's the play, that hey, we're actually not signing you to the Clippers. Yeah, we're actually you're gonna going be a to Sonic Seattle. in two years. Yeah, full circle, man. Like game. Oh of Thrones. man. Okay, I if that actually does happen, I would laugh and be okay oh. with it because that'd just be funny. If yeah. the legacy play isn't, you're gonna bring a championship to the Clippers. <laughs> you're gonna bring basketball and a championship and a championship back, back to Seattle. <laughs> I love it. Uh, CP, man, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. I appreciate uh, the work that you do. I think, I sp- guys, if you aren't listening or watching what he does over at Knicks Fan TV, you're missing out. Just plain and simple. Um, thank you for coming on Nothing But Knicks, though. This is a blast, man. Absolutely, man. It's been great. And, and we're going to have you guys on our roundtables, our show as well, man. So great stuff, Andrew. Appreciate it. Bro. Looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs>